All right, folks, so a little lesson on propaganda techniques. So in the project, your job is to create your own piece of political propaganda. However, if you want it to be effective, you're going to have to know propaganda techniques. In fact, a requirement of the project is to include at least two different propaganda techniques. All right, now first, let's talk about propaganda itself. What is it? Now you have two definitions here, right? So the first definition is in any association, systematic scheme or concerted movement for the propagation of a particular practice or doctrine. The systematic propagation of information or ideas by an interested party, especially in a tendentious way, in order to encourage or instill a particular attitude or response. Now, that's a very technical definition. What you're essentially talking about is that it's a planned attempt to get you to believe something or do something. That is propaganda. It's not necessarily good or bad in and of itself. It's just an attempt to get you, the public, to believe something or take a particular action. We see it in all aspects of our life. We see it in related to the COVID pandemic. So those images that you've seen on Schoology, like you have a poster right here, the tale of two pandemics, this is propaganda. The goal of this propaganda was to get us to take actions as a public to flatten the curve. It's like wear a mask to socially distance. All right. So the definition that you probably want to remember is the second definition down there. A technique of persuasion aimed at influencing individual or group behaviors. Now, these techniques that we're going to talk about originated with World War I. So the, the goal of the government is they hired a bunch of artists to persuade the public to get behind the war effort. And they found that certain techniques were effective in getting the public to believe and take the actions that they wanted them to. So what were these techniques that were effective? Okay, we'll go through them, but just note that these techniques have been used by the government throughout history to get our support for a variety of things. They're also used by private businesses with advertising. So they're used in all walks of life. All right, so here's one technique that's called name calling. And in this technique, you're attributing to an idea or person a bad label. You're not going to discuss the facts. You're just going to give the opposition a bad name. And it works. Our current president, Donald Trump, is the master of the name call. He did it throughout his, in 2016, when he was running for president, he used a variety of names to characterize his opposition, whether they were Republican or Democrat, and they stuck and they worked. So you see some examples here where he was referring to Jeb Bush as low energy Jeb. There was little Marco, there was crooked Hillary. All of those name calls stuck and worked, okay? Another technique is called transfer. With transfer, you're carrying over the authority and prestige of a respected or revered person, institution, value, or belief to a less acceptable entity. Now, that is, a again, the first definition is always going to be kind of a more intellectual definition. The second definition is a little easier to understand. Use symbols to accomplish purposes for which they're not intended. So you take a recognizable symbol, something that people already have meaning and emotion attached to it, and you place that symbol on another object. So you can see that being used over here in Wings for America. Now, whenever you're analyzing propaganda, the first thing you have to kind of ask yourself is, what is the message? What does this piece of propaganda want me to do or believe? Well, it wants me to believe something about the Air Corps, the U.S. Army, right? And then they have the statement wings over for America, but the transfer is the eagle. It's taking a symbol, a recognizable symbol, and it's saying being a part of the Air Corps is like being the eagle, which is a symbol for the United States. Not only do they have the eagle flying in formation as if it's one of the airplanes, but they take the star symbol on the wings of the airplane and put it on the eagle itself. So the artist is saying, hey, everything you believe about the eagle and feel about the eagle, you should transfer and feel that same way about participation in the Air Corps. That's how transfer works. Now, you can have negative transfer as well. And you see that oftentimes whenever people put devil's horns on something. Okay, we already have a negative image of the devil, and we're going to say, all right, all those things you feel about the devil transfer to this other entity as well. That's how transfer works. Okay, testimonial. 
Testimonial is similar to transfer in that there's going to be a recognizable person. So the use of statements from persons perceived as either good or evil for the sake of either winning ac acceptance or rejection. Now, in a modern day world, we see testimonial more as endorsement and usually celebrity endorsement. You get a recognizable figure to endorse your product or to endorse your campaign. All right. So I want you for U.S. Army was the classic testimonial. You have a recognizable figure, Uncle, Uncle Sam, who's perceived as good in the embodiment of everything that's good about the United States. And he's pointing right at you and he's saying, I want you for the U.S. Army. Okay, that's testimonial. Okay, this it has to be a recognizable person actually speaking to you. They have to be testifying for it to be considered testimonial. All right, let's move on to the next one. Plain folk. So plain folk is the characterization of a persuasive message of propaganda as already good and acceptable, acceptable because it originates from the people. Now, the more easily understood definition says it's like it's just pretending to be one of the common people. We see this a lot in political advertising. Now you will note when we watch this video here, there's also a transfer going on. There's a recognizable symbol, but the politician himself, Roger Williams, is exercising the propaganda technique of plain folks because he's pretending to be one of the common people. Whenever you see a politician wearing a collared shirt, but without a tie, and they roll up the sleeves, that's plain folks. So here you go. You're not a victim. You're, you're a patriot. You're an opportunist. Let's take advantage of it, okay? They don't listen to me. You know, I've been talking to these guys forever, and they still do not listen. <laughs> Unbelievable. You know, all these guys want is they, they want more shelter, they want more feed, but yet the government's making it harder on me. They're taxing me to death. Uh, I can't afford to build that. When I don't build it, they think I owe it to them. See, all you guys want, I, I, you want a handout. I don't have something in it, now you're getting mad again, okay? Years ago, we didn't have this problem. Yeah, but now it's just a hassle to get them to do anything. Don't turn your head. I know you're embarrassed because you're part of the problem, all right? But we can turn it around. These donkeys don't live in the United States of France. They live in the United States of America. They're going to have to get with it. You all heard me talk about the Constitution. Have you ever heard of the Constitution? It's a great document. They keep thinking that Obama's going to take care of them, that Obama's going to feed them, Obama's going to build their barn. Look, if I can get Obama out of health care and we stuck that, I can get these teeth fixed that you got, okay? I can get them fixed, all right? But he's got to get away. He's got to let me do the things I need to do. See those big ears? Still can't hear me. Unbelievable. I got to tell you guys something. I'll be honest with you. It's a lot easier to feed elephants than it is donkeys. Okay? And if I have to trade you in for elephants, I'll do it. All right. If you didn't catch the transfer there, he's using the image of the donkey. Right? He kind of alludes to that at the end when he talks about the other recognizable symbol, which would be the elephant. Right? So he wants you to believe certain things about Democrats. He's also, the action he wants you to take is to vote for him. Right. And then the care, the technique of him pretending to be one of the common people, just a regular old farmer trying to raise donkeys. Right. That's the And it's a persuasive technique. All right. Let's move on to the next one. You're not a victim. You're you're. A I always do that. Here we go. Card stacking. Now, card stacking is very complex, but it's also a very effective technique. So the first definition says the selection and use of facts or distortions of facts, accumulated or manipulated images, and illogical or fallacious statements to support or deny an idea, program, person, or product. Now, a more modern day understanding of card stacking is presenting only one side of an issue through the distortion and juggling of facts. So you're stacking the cards in your favor by selecting only certain facts to support the action you want people to take or the belief you want people to believe. Now, in the classic sense of card stacking, you're basically, you have a stack of cards and you have a statement or an action on each of the cards. And if you go through each of those facts, it kind of makes a logical sense, but just the top card and the bottom card by itself is illogical. So this poster right here was the classic card stack. It says, eat less bread. 
Okay, so the message was, is that they wanted the American public to eat less bread. That's the action they wanted people to take. Now, what they're trying to get you to believe is that if you take that action, it's going to help win the war. Okay, but it's missing all of the cards in between. They provide a few to help you make the connection that if the American public eats less bread, we're going to save the wheat. If we save the wheat, there'll be more wheat and bread for the army. If there's more, well, actually for the Navy. If there's more wheat and bread for the Navy, okay, the people in the Navy are going to fight better. And if they fight better, the fleet is going to compete better. And if the fleet competes better, we'll win the war, right? But by itself, me eating less bread is not necessarily going to lead to victory in the war. It's stacking the cards. You see that all the time. If you take this action, this will be the result. And you have to ask yourself, is that a logical conclusion? A lot of times it's not. Okay, that's the card stacking. All right, let's move on to the next one. Bandwagon. Bandwagon you see all over the place. Representing information to make one believe that all members of the group or every citizen of the nation think, believe, or act in a certain way. Follow the crowd, crowd be with the majority. Hey, everybody's doing this. Everybody believes this, so you should do it too. Okay, now in this particular ad, this is one of the first political ads that was ever run on TV for Dwight Eisenhower. It has a couple of techniques working in there. You probably see them, but you can also clearly see the bandwagon. Okay, let's take a listen. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president. You like I, I like I, everybody likes I for president. Hang out the banner, beat the drum, we'll take I to Washington. We don't want John or Dean or Harry, let's do that big job right. Just get in step with the guy that's up, get in step with I. You like I, I like I, everybody likes I for president. Hang out the banner, beat the drum, we'll take I to Washington. Bandwagon should be quite clear there. Just in the, the refrain, I like Ike, you like, like Ike, everybody likes Ike. Everybody likes Ike. So you should be on board with Ike as well. That's the bandwagon. If you're watching closely, you probably recognize the plain folks technique in there as well. So the little parade of people included people from all walks of life, all professions, just that the normal everyday person was in support of Ike as well. So you often see two techniques, if not more, working together to get you to take the action or to believe the belief they want you to take, okay? There it goes playing again. I'll figure this out one of these days. There we go. Now, scare tactic is our last technique. It's a modern day technique. Really, it's just a card stack that if you don't take this particular action, this horrible thing's going to happen. Or if we let people take this particular action, this horrible thing is going to happen. Okay, often the two are should not be connected. It's an illogical connection to make. So any use of imagery, sounds, or spoken words that are used to convey or establish a sense of fear or foreboding in order to influence behavior. Okay, now it's not just note that it's not a tech. If you use card stacking and then you say your second technique is scare tactic, I'll be like, uh uh, that's the same technique. All right, but let's take a look at a very classic, probably the original scare tactic ad. From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Six, 
Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. Wow. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov. Pretty powerful right there, right? Okay, so what's the message the ad wants you to take? Well, they want you to vote for Johnson. What they don't tell you directly is what they want you to believe about Johnson's opponent. They never mentioned the opponent once. The opponent was Barry Goldwater. And what was so powerful about this ad, it was like only run one time, I believe, and it like just destroyed Goldwater's candidacy. So people have been carrying around this image of Barry Goldwater in their head. They couldn't quite articulate it, but they had this belief of what Barry Goldwater might be. Because at the Republican nomination com nominating convention, Barry Goldwater got up there. He accepted the Republican nomination for president. He, he had just become the Republican's nominee for president. He got up there and he gave a speech. And in his speech, he used these words. He said, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And people were carrying around those words in their head. They're like, what does he mean by extremism? What action would he be willing to take in defense of liberty? Johnson runs this ad and people put the two together. He doesn't ask them to. They just do it naturally. That's why it's such a beautiful card stack that if you vote for Goldwater, who said extremism is OK, it's going to result in nuclear war. And the death of small children, which obviously is not true. Right. A fallacious statement. OK, but it worked. It destroyed Goldwater's candidacy. All right. So. Sometimes these uh, card stacks work when they're very powerful. All right, let's move on to the next one here. So that's all your techniques. This is just going to start again, isn't it? There we go. And then we'll go over here and then we'll click. All right, so now here's what you need to understand. So I call this the monster cookie, is that sometimes with propaganda, they just throw in as many techniques as they can. Because if one technique doesn't work, Maybe the next te technique will work on you. So I call it the monster cookie because when you bite into a monster cookie, there's going to be chocolate chips, there's going to be M&Ms, there might even be nuts. Okay, there's going to be everything in there. And so whatever you like is going to be in that cookie. So whatever technique actually appeals to you is in this poster. So what does this poster want you to do? Pretty clear, it wants you to buy victory bonds. That's how the government raised money to pay for the war. You'd buy a bond. And then later down the road, the government would pay you back that money with a little interest. And they're trying to get you to believe that if you buy a victory bond, it's going to hasten the homecoming. Now, that's the card stack because me, myself, buying a bond isn't necessarily going to help us win the war faster. Right? That's the card stack that's working in this poster. I can also see that it's, it's using plain folks. Because you can, you can visualize yourself as any one of these people. You could be the soldier that wants to come home. You could be like the mom or the uncle that sent their eldest son off to fight in the war effort. You might be the little brother, little sister. You could even be the coy little girlfriend off here to the side hiding there that's wondering the whole time, is he going to still love me when he comes back? Right? You could be any of these people. Right? Now, what's really working subtly in this one is bandwagon because you have to look closely at the art here. So you'll notice that in the windows of this tenement here, you got this little blue star on a white background with a red border. And that was very typical. What that meant is that household has sent someone off to fight in the war effort. And in another window, you might see three stars. In another window, you see stars. You see stars in all these windows. All these different households have done their part. They've sent people to fight in the war effort. What's your part? Your part is to buy a victory bond. So that's the bandwagon technique working in here as well. So at least three techniques working in the same poster. Now, finally, the more subtle you can be, okay, the more that poster will work on somebody. And they won't even know that it's working on them, okay? Now, I forgot one technique in the ad here, glittering generality. 
So glittering generality, I like to call it glittering gen, right? Is when we take like a phrase that has extra meaning and weight attached to it. Okay, and we're going to use that phrase, that extra meaning and weight. If you think about dog whistles that you hear about in, in political advertising a lot, that actually could, characterize, could be characterized as a glittering generality. In this poster here, you see the phrase, or the ramparts we watch, right, which comes right from the Star Spangled Banner. So it's a recognizable phrase. It has extra weight and meaning attached to it, and they're attaching that to your participation in the Army Air Forces. They want you to come and participate in it. So you got a little glittering generality going on there. It's not a recognizable symbol, but it operates the same way. You have a recognizable phrase that has extra weight and meaning, and I want you to transfer that extra weight and meaning of the phrase to your participation in the Army Air Forces. But because it's a phrase, it's a glittering generality, right? Now, if I look closely at this picture, I look, I see this gentleman here holding a bomb right in the middle of the poster, right? That could be anybody. So it's plain folk. All right, all right, no problem. Pretty good poster. I'm walking past this poster day in and day out. There's a third technique that is subtly working on me, and I don't realize it. In fact, the further you get away from this poster, the more recognizable you might see that poster, because there is a recognizable symbol that has extra weight and meaning. So I don't know. You'll note that that gentleman appears to be standing in the clouds. And if you look specifically at the clouds, you might actually see the recognizable symbol. I'll give you a moment to figure it out. Bam, you're right. Those are angel wings. That guy right there is an angel. What kind of angel is he? I look at the phrase or the ramparts we watch, which is the defensive part of a castle. I think, oh my word, that guy's a defensive angel. He's defending the United States. He's an archangel and I want to be like him. And so I joined the Army Air Forces, right? Okay. Now I might never actually recognize that those are angel wings, but that recognizable symbol is still working on me the entire time. The more subtle it is, the more powerful it is. Okay. Now, my unconscious mind needs to recognize that symbol. It can't be so subtle that there's no, I won't recognize it at all, right? But it's very powerful. All right, so those are your, are your techniques. You're going to have to include at least two techniques in your piece of propaganda. You can come back to this. You can watch them again. And you can watch other political ads and see uh, and make sure that you first, what's the message? What do they want me to do? What do they want me to believe? And then you go in and say, okay, what technique are they using to effectively communicate that message? All right. Thank you. We'll talk to you later.